So a few weeks ago, I was having dinner with my in-laws, and my mother-in-law says to me, so what's up with AIDS these days? I haven't heard anything lately. And you know what? She's right. We haven't really heard that much about AIDS lately. It's sort of fallen out of the, the mainstream of our national dialogue. We just, we just don't talk about AIDS the way that we used to. And, and why is that? Why, why aren't we talking enough about AIDS? There's a lot of reasons. Maybe we're satisfied with the status quo. The death rate for AIDS peaked in, in the mid-90s. And since then, there's been a decline and then a, a leveling off. And so the, the death rate from AIDS has been pretty steady the past few years. Maybe we're happy with that number. The number is 1.8 million lives per year lost. Maybe we're okay with that. No. Are you okay with that? I'm certainly not. Maybe we don't talk about AIDS because talking about AIDS means we have to talk about sex. And we know how uncomfortable we are as a society talking about sex. We just look at the flap over the HPV vaccine. You know, sex and sexually transmitted diseases are not things we talk about in polite company. Or maybe we don't talk about AIDS because the people who are most affected, hardest hit by this disease, are largely invisible. Many of those hit hardest by AIDS are disenfranchised. We, we, they're, they're out of our view, they're out of our consciousness. And so I think tonight, right now, we, we need to restart this dialogue about AIDS. And we need to start talking about how we're going to end, aid, end AIDS once and for all. Because you know, most of you, you guys are students. Like, you, you've never lived in a world without AIDS. I'm, I'm old enough that I can remember those days. But you know, it's been 30 years, 30 years. And so you who've never known a world without AIDS, I'm asking you to use your imagination and imagine what a world without AIDS would look like. And I'm asking you to make this a reality. And I know I'm asking a lot, but um, my generation has something that we can contribute. Uh, about 15 years ago, there was an amazing breakthrough in the way that we treat HIV. Potent antiretroviral drugs, Varapine, AZT, Tenofovir. These drugs were developed by scientists, and then these drugs allow people who have HIV, if they can get access to these meds, and if they can take these meds, these drugs allow them to to not die from the virus. It keeps the virus in check. It suppresses the virus. It doesn't eliminate it, but it keeps it in check indefinitely. And so these drugs now, which are here in 2011, even more potent, you know, even fewer side effects, you know, even easier to take, these drugs give someone who has HIV not, not months, not years, but decades of living from the worst effects of the virus. And, and the good news is, is even better because these drugs not only help us treat HIV, they help us prevent the transmission as well. Because someone who has their viral load suppressed is much more likely, to, much, sorry, much less likely to pass it on to their sexual partner. It doesn't eliminate the risk, but it dramatically, dramatically lowers the risk. And lately at AIDS conferences, you know, you're hearing a word, a buzzword that's sort of swelling up that you didn't hear five years ago. Cure. We're actually talking realistically about a cure for HIV. I mean, it's amazing times to be alive as, as a scientist. You know, my, my lab at Harvey Mudd College is working in collaboration with, with a group at the City of Hope National Medical Center on a gene therapy approach that would then control the virus, you know, indefinitely with, without the meds. Amazing stuff. But I'm here tonight because all of this, you know, it's beautiful. Beautiful science. I, I could geek out for, for, for hours about this with you, but it's not enough. All, all of this, this, this progress is, is, is not enough. This is, this is all we've got, and, and it's amazing. Don't, don't get me wrong. We, we, we don't have a chance. We don't have a chance of really ending AIDS. Because in order to end AIDS, we have to really understand HIV. And you know, I, I don't mean the, the virus. I, I can draw for you what the virus looks like, all of the, the molecular structure, and how it interacts with the cell surface receptors of the cells of your immune system. But that's not really enough, is it? That's not enough to really understand the virus, which is what we need to do. So we're gonna do a little thought experiment, all right? So I want you all to imagine that you're at your doctor's office and you're at your annual physical and you're sitting up on the examination table and you've got that, you know, in that disposable you know, hospital gown thing that can make you wear it. It's open in the back and so you're all you know, kind of naked and exposed like, that's what you're wearing. You're sitting on this examination table, so nervously waiting for your doctor to come in. And, and your doctor, you know, eventually after a long wait, you wait, wait too long, you know, comes in and says, there's something unusual in your routine blood work. And you tested positive 
for human immunodeficiency virus. You guys are positive, positive for HIV. Think about that, positive. You are positive for HIV. How are you gonna tell your, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse? How are you gonna tell your parents? Positive. Are you, how, how do you tell your friends? Are you gonna tell your friends? Do you have to tell your friends? You know, how do you feel? Positive. Feel ashamed? You feel, embar feel embarrassed? You feel isolated? This, this, this matters. The, this is a disease that has a huge human and societal context. And that matters. It's a disease that has baggage. And that baggage matters. And so, all these wonderful drugs that, that scientists like myself are working to develop, and, and, you know, and then they are they're miracles. I mean, they're amazing. And they, they, what they do is they help someone not be dead. And, and, and that's good. But there's so much more to living than just being not dead. And so, and I, I don't think I really got this until a few years ago. I started working with an organization called Fidel AIDS Project, which is a local AIDS support organization. And they serve clients who are HIV positive in San Bernardino and Riverside County, you know, Eastern Los Angeles. And I got to meet and talk with some people and sort of really hear what it's like to live with HIV. Not, not just not die from HIV, but, but really live. And so one of the, the people I met there, this amazing guy, became a friend of mine, a guy named Caesar. And Caesar told me what it was like when he was diagnosed with HIV. You know, you just had to do a thought experiment where you had to pretend that you were just told you were positive. You know, he got that for real. And he had to go tell his family. And Caesar's family is incredibly important to him. And right after he got his diagnosis, he went, you know, shortly thereafter, it was Thanksgiving time, and so he went home for, for Thanksgiving dinner. And you know, the whole family was there. The grandparents, the nephews, and nieces, uncles, cousins, a huge family. And you know, it was Thanksgiving, so at every place setting, you know, finest china, the fancy silver, the crystal goblet. But, but at Caesar's place setting, it looked different. At Caesar's place setting, there was a paper plate, a plastic fork, a plastic knife, a plastic spoon, a little dinky plastic cup. Can you imagine how that made Caesar feel? I mean, how did it make you feel when you go home for Thanksgiving, if that's how you were treated? You just picture these, these walls, these barriers going up between Caesar and his family. Lifelong, that, that lifelong network of support, isolated from. See, so his, his mom thought that you know, he might pass the virus to them if you yeah, through the sharing these utensils. And just, the good news is, though, that Caesar didn't give up, and his family didn't give up on Caesar. And Caesar worked with his dad, worked with his dad first, and got, got his dad on board, got his dad to understand that. And then his dad you know, worked with the rest of the family. And now they understand, and they understand that they can share utensils with Caesar. They can, they can hug Caesar, they can kiss Caesar. And Caesar's doing great now. In fact, I mean, he went back to college and he had dropped out of school when, when he got his diagnosis, but he's back in school. And in his spare time, Caesar you know, is out there volunteering, teaching others about HIV, trying to fight the stigma, this ignorance that's out there. And because I mean, the drugs you know, stopped the virus from taking over Caesar's body. But it, it was Caesar and FAP, you know, and his family, his friends, that's what helped the virus from not taking over his life. Let me tell you about another guy I met at FAP, the Fiddle Age Project. Another amazing guy. A guy named Dennis. And, and you know, Dennis would know, always make everyone laugh, just always crack a smile. And I remember Dennis always telling me about working at the junior high where he worked as a counselor, working with um, at-risk youth. And so, you know, kids who, you know, like him, grew up in a rough part of town and were having a fine, hard time finding their, their way through, and he would work them. He was amazing at this. And, and Dennis was also HIV positive. And he also had the medicine. He had, he had the pills. But Dennis had a lot of demons that he fought. He had a lot of pain. And in the end, he, he couldn't really go on. He, and he made the decision to stop taking the meds. And very shortly after that, Dennis died. So he's not here. I mean, he, sh he should be here. He should be right here tonight, you know, sitting next to you. He had the pills. He had the medicine. But, but it wasn't enough. 
See, it's, it's not about the virus. It's about the person. Our responsibility is not to the virus. Forget the virus. It's, it's to the person. There's a world of difference in that. So, so at Fiddle Age Project, we spend a lot of time providing the, the clients we work with just really basic things, you know, food, and housing, and transportation, access to medical care. And we also give them something else. I think that the something else is, is what makes all the difference. It's something intangible, it's something that, 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 that really makes it possible to, to live and really live with HIV. And what we give them is hope. And, and hope is this, this connection to the future that we're talking about here tonight. And I know this is an overused word, and I'm not talking about some you know, wishy-washy, you know, just general vague feeling that things are going to get better someday, some, some daydreaming. I'm not talking about something really concrete and specific, something that builds on all of the scientific progress, but at the same time also is deeply rooted in, in human-to-human -human connection. And to illustrate what this sort of hope looks like, let me tell you a little story. Over the summer, I took some of my research students from my lab at Harvey Mudd, and I took them out to San Bernardino to meet with some of the clients at Fiddle Age Project. And we, we did a session there. And so we, we, had, we had a whole evening with, with them, and we talked about our research and what we're trying to do, describe the science that we're doing, and how we're trying to you know, manipulate these molecules so that one day we might have a cure for HIV. And, I told them how hard it was, and we told them all about you know, driving out to City of Hope and how cool that was, and then our collaborators and how awesome they are. And we went through all this and laid it out for them. And, and the clients, they, they just, just ate it up. They, they were so amazed. You know, first of all, that, that my three students that I brought with me, you know, to them, looked so young that, that they, these young students could actually do this work. And furthermore, that they were doing this work for them. For them. You know, those who. And as we were. Done with the session, we, we left and we were walking outside out of the office complex, and there was this dingy hallway in, in San Bernardino. And one of the clients came up to us, a guy named Eric, and he, he talked with us some more. And you know, he, he again he thanked my students and shared some of his story with them, you know, some of his experiences, shared some of his wisdom with, with my students. And then when this was done, you know, he, he gave each of my students a big, big giant bear. Reach out and hug them really tight. And he was so overwhelmed with, with this emotion that they would spend all these hours in the lab working for him so that he, Eric, might, might live. And he started to cry. Like, I, I could see the tears coming down his face. So it was just so overwhelming for him. And you know, can you just think about like, what, what that did to my students, the, 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 these, these students who you know, signed up for the summer job? and. I mean, it no longer was just something to put on their resume, or just a little experience trying to get into grad school. I mean, all of a sudden, I mean, they were, they were, they were, they weren't, it wasn't about the virus anymore, it was about Eric. Like, they were there for Eric. And, and you think about Eric, like, you know, what he felt. I mean, when he goes to bed at night on, on the nightstand, you know, there's the pill bottle of all these, these, these meds he has to take you know, every night in order to keep the virus in control. And, but, but Eric's got these three women on his side, pulling for him, working for him. You know, how, how could he lose? Like, just think about what, what that, that hope did for him. So Eric was, was, was so overwhelmed, you know, he just squeezed really tight. and started to weep, positively weep. And you know, I, I've been in science you know, a long time. I, I spent 15 years trying to find cures for diseases like cancer and AIDS. And you know, like, like everyone else, you know, I, I get started with, with, with good data and small wins here and there. But I've never seen something like that to have that sort of impact on someone. It, that's, that's what it takes. That's how we're going to end AIDS. That, that's what we need. You know, so something, something like that, a, a miracle like that, is what everyone who has HIV needs. That, that's what we all need. And so the beauty of this, though, is that we're all capable of it. Everyone else, all of you, can do this. And so I challenge to you then is to go out and look for those connections. Look for, for those ways that you can create hope. I mean, do you, do you want to cure AIDS? Do you want to cure cancer? Do you want to eliminate poverty, stop climate change? Any of these, these, these tough issues facing us. You have to embrace the, the profound importance of these human-to-human -human connections 
So therefore, what I want you to do is to go out there, spread love, spread hope, create miracles. Thank you.